in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 7. I'm going to talk about response to his presence and I think from the testimony on Sunday, the response to the person of Jesus in that room. But we're not going to relegate it to that one story. We're going to fashion this to Jesus and his presence. He is omnipresent. And <clears throat> you can sense him anywhere if your attention is upon him. And if your attention, our attention is on him, our focus, our concentration, our heart's eye is looking at Jesus, it, it creates a reciprocation of a sense we call a feeling of his presence begins to invade your life and you really can sense he is near. And the truth is, he is. It's not a trick of the mind. It is not a manifestation of a slight of some sort of trickery. Jesus Christ is near to us. He has promised that even tonight, if we believe it. Amen. Hey, Brother Jim, because the Bible says, and we often use the verse, and it's not, to be, it's not that it's overworked, it's the truth. Uh, where two or three are gathered together, he said, he is here. He's gathered together in his name. There am I in the midst of them. And so we believe that and we understand it. Now, in saying that in 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and 7, now we're going to Psalm 116 tonight because this is the response of David to the presence of God. But in 1 Chronicles 16, 7, then I want to come to this Psalm 132 because I have to prove what I'm saying because it, it just sounds too outlandish. And I've ministered on before, and people said, is that really true? In First Chronic, Chronicles 16, 7 says, Then on that day David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. Now, you say, well, what is the significance? And now we'll go to Psalm 132. It is the Ark of the Covenant has in coming back, in coming to Jerusalem. David is bringing back the Ark of the Covenant. What is so amazing about this story? It always fascinates me, and you cannot get all of its truths and its historical evidences in, in one chapter of the Bible. You have to take it from 1 Samuel, in chapter 6 and 7, your, your, your chronicles, you even have to go to the book of Psalms. And when you read about where was the ark, how did it get there, what happened to the ark, and you have to take a, a, a literally a conglomerate of, of verses and chapters, and it creates a picture of what happened to the ark of the covenant, and it is astonishing. It is really out of kilter, out of character. It is, it is seemingly, you have to read it for yourself to understand it and believe what happened. The Ark of the Covenant, as you all know, is the centerpiece of the very manifestation of God on earth prior to the coming of Jesus incarnate. It, this, this, this box was more than just any box. This four-foot box that we shall say was covered, this sheet of wood covered in gold and these cherubims that was over the top of the mercy seat touching the wingspans. And it, it, it's an amazing looking box. <laughs> but inside of it was some materials. We don't get into all of that tonight, but it literally... Uh, demonstrated, manifested. It's not that God lived in a box, but it was a, a focal point here on earth. It was a tangible evidence. It was a tangible reference of the heavenly father, the heavenly God, the merciful savior, uh, pre-incarnate, and it was his presence. 
and it, it symbolized it, but not only as a symbol, there was actual manifestations uh, of that presence contained in that area, especially in the holiest of holies. Now, with that being said, with that Ark of the Covenant, if you remained in obedience, active in worship, proper representation, that piece and that instrument and that piece of furniture, what it symbolized and what it housed would bring you victory every time you went into battle. Because God's presence cannot be defeated. And it also symbolized the provision for Israel, the power for Israel, the authority of Israel, the strength of Israel, everything that Israel needed. Basically, the Ark of the Covenant was the channel and the bridge all the way to the planet of heaven, all the way down to earth, wherever Israel was. This was the portal, not to overplay things, but just to really give some vivid imagery to us. This was the portal of God here on earth and in a design designated location for him to show up and really to show out in manifestation of super divine power from another world. He chose Israel as we call it the church of the wilderness, whatever you want to design it. But this, this group of people who is designated as ambassadors and as a nation on this earth to convert all nations to the worship of the one true God. Now, when they would go into battle, they always took the Ark of the Covenant. How many knows what I'm telling you the truth? They would always take the Ark of the Covenant because when they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle, it was their insurance of victory. It wasn't that they so much depended on their own prowess or their own training or their own infantry skills or anything else. It is because when they went into battle, what gave them the confidence was their faith in the one that that ark represented, and it was the God that they worshiped. He was the banner. He was the rallying cry. He was the centerpiece of their lives, both in peace and in wartime, and God was always there in manifestation and in this ark of the covenant. Now, this brings me to the beginning of the astounding, astonishing part of the story. This was a fabric of their life. It was an interwoven uh, necessity. It, it was an important part of their culture, existence, even their identification. Nations knew them because they had this Ark of the Covenant and this God they worship. Uh, they, they realized the power that this Ark of the Covenant symbolized even other nations. And so when I pondered on this even years ago, and I thought, who in their right mind would ever want to give up the very symbol of your existence, power, and your distinguishing feature is this God who lives with you in manifested glory and holiest of holies and in this Ark of the Covenant, who in their right mind would ever let go of such a powerful piece of the fabric of your very existence and life? And I pondered on that and realized as I, as a young Christian reading through the Bible and these particular verses and starting to realize that not only did they forget about and began to ignore the Ark of the Covenant, they even lost the Ark of the Covenant. And when I had to read it multiple times, even years ago, and still to this day, I still have to read it over and over because it is hard to understand. And you say, well, what happened? Well, the Ark of the Covenant... <laughs> When I say this, you look at Psalm 130, what I tell you, 136, or 130, I'm sorry, 132 in verse 6. And there came a time in, in David's, when he ascended the throne, and he called a council together, and he said, I want to know, as we study history, there was an ark of the covenant. <clears throat> The Ark of the Covenant was our power. It was our centerpiece. 
And I would like to know, where is this Ark of the Covenant? This always blows my mind because in this discussion amongst themselves, no one knew where the Ark of the Covenant was. Nobody. Not one of his senior counselors, not one of his chief of staff, not one of his, his, his military uh, uh, chiefs of staff. Nobody knew when he asked the question, where is the Ark of the Covenant? We do not know. You don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is, the very symbol of our existence, the very power, the very strength of our military might, the very focus of our worship, the God that, and, and all of this that was given throughout our history, <clears throat> and you do not know where it is. No, no one knows. And as a result, <clears throat> this particular Ark of the Covenant had been lost. Brother Jim, this, this is what amazes me. Not just five years, six years. It had been lost for upwards of 70 years. Nobody inquired. Nobody even talked about it. Well, there was one time there was a mention. I'm sorry. There was a mention in Saul's reign. They never had it. 20 years before Saul, it went missing. During his reign, 40 years, you can do the math, I can do it, I even went to Greencastle and I started adding this up. 40 years during Saul's reign, it was never brought back. 20 years before that's not, now you're up to 60. Now we are in 10 years in David's reign, we're at 70 years, the Ark of the Covenant is missing. Where is it? <laughs> And so he has a meeting and they decide that they are going to commission scouts to go find, canvas the whole territory and country, go out, find the Ark of the Covenant. And you will read in 132 verse 6, this is again how you have to bring everything together. And the Ark was found, let's read it together, lo, are you ready? Lo, we heard of it at e Ephrata. Ready? We found it in the fields. <laughs> Every time I read it, I stop and pause and shake my head. I studied it. I thought, well, it's different in translation, Pastor Matt. I just, you know, maybe it's not worded correctly. I studied that out. What's it mean? Well, it means what it says. The, the wood there, if you want to get real technical woods, just simply means forest. <laughs> it doesn't get any better. I thought maybe I'm misunderstanding. Then I read somewhere else, theologians, well, it's in the fields of Jair. Well, does that mean, well, maybe it was in somebody's living room, but it was low. No, it, it's in the field. In the middle of a forest. <laughs> now, now, <laughs> you say, what on earth happened? Well, you remember these, this story. The Philistines at one time had the Ark of the Covenant. Do you remember they got mad because they put him in, in the temple of Dagon? You remember this? And, and when they put him in the temple of Dagon, in the middle of the night, the presence of God shook the place, and the image of Dagon fell down and broke his head. <laughs> and the Philistines got mad, said, we got to get him out of here, meaning the Ark of the Covenant. Said, you got to get him out of here. He'll, he'll, he'll tear up the whole place. We're not worthy of this anyway. This is, this, it's going to kill us all. And you say, what did they do? This is where Kathy's business gets involved. And they put, the, they put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. And had, it, was a, it was a cow who had a calf. I don't know. It's just in the story. I'm just telling you, uh, Kathy. And they, they beat the cow in the rear end, I guess. And the cow just took off down the road and they just waved goodbye. And, and Sam, I'm telling the truth, ain't I? <laughs> and I mean, you can't make this up. They, the Philistine says, good riddance. Where was it going? They didn't know and they didn't care. Just get out of here. So the cow and the calf bowling down the road, pulling a cart and the Ark of the Covenant is on it and it goes and disappears. And it ends up in, in the land and it near Abinadab's place. 
I, I mean, it just, it just gets more and more crazy. Uh, and Abinadab, he recognizes what it is and his family, but they, they don't care. <laughs> Astonishing. They don't care. How the cow got away from the cart, who unhitched it, who got it off, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But what the Bible does say, when they heard about it, they, somebody near there, they said, have you heard of the Ark of the Covenant? Well, the last time we heard, uh, a cow went by here many years ago. <laughs> I just, you can't make it up. And, 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 and it went by us here on the road. And we think it ended up down in the forest it, over there in Jair. And, and we think it's out by Abinadab's, out, out in that area. They go out and scout. And, and what we just read, I'm not making up, said we heard about it over there in Ephrata. And, they, and they, so they launched search parties and they come across it in the field. This is what just a field. The Ark of the Covenant is in a field. It's, it's the same. How many has ever went go down the road and somebody's got a car? It's been there since 1953. And there's trees have grown up through the floorboards, busted out the roof, and you can't move the car even if you could get it running because the tree's in the center of it. Here you have this, this Ark of the Covenant, weeds, tree, everything around it, and there it sits, just discarded. <clears throat> I tell you what hit me about that. Because I can't help but look at that and fast forward to today. Here's the thing that stands out to me. Nobody cared that the presence of God was nowhere around. Didn't care. Now listen to this. As I pondered on this, I thought, you know, it's no different today. Amen. Brother Jim, whew. a week ago, I, I was sent this video by my brother, and I tell you, it's appalling what's going on in the Church of America today. I'm telling you, it's appalling. This just happened a week ago. You might have seen it. It made news. Do you see it? A major denomination, Pentecostal denomination. You 50-50, it's, it's the biggest. It's the biggest. In their capital where their headquarters are, mega church, 16,000, 17,000 people. They are not in the church. They go down the street to an arena. Their head pastor has put on a, this is only a week ago. I'm not talking ancient history here. Puts on a pastor's leadership conference and the arena is filled with thousands of people. I watched this myself. Filled with thousands of people, pastor's leadership conference. To open the program, weird music comes on, and this is their words, not mine. I'm only repeating what they said. An ex-male stripper comes out onto a mini-made stage that has a pole in the center of it. He gets up on the stage rips his shirt off, okay, gyrates around, grabs a sword, swallows the sword, does an act and all of this stuff, then climbs the pole 
just like strippers do and puts on a show to kick off a pastor's leadership conference of the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world, in their headquarters. A man gets on stage, thankfully, one of the speakers calls it out. The problem is the pastor called him out and made him leave the conference. Now, this is what is, this is what is astonishing to me. Nobody cares that the presence of God is not in the building. Nobody cares. You talk about breaking the heart. This breaks my heart. Nobody cares. You, you say, take it further. I, I can prove it to you. We are living in an age right now, an hour in the church. I'll tell you how no one cares. It is rare, it is rare that you ever hear of anyone really getting saved. And nobody cares. That should be alarming to us. I'm going to, I'm going to move on with it. It, 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 is a, it is, it's almost playing the lottery seems like. It is a rare thing ever in the American church. You ever hear of somebody bona fidely being healed by the power of God? And yet, nobody cares his presence is not there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It, 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 it's appalling to me, the more, uh, Lord opening the eyes. It is appalling to me that one of the least things done in the church nowadays is even people praying. But nobody cares. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't overdo this point that I, I, by God's grace, trying to make here. I made a statement this week even concerning this situation because I'm telling you, uh, 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 it, it's, it's evil what is going on in the American church because you have most ministers will not preach that God has the power to instantly deliver a man from sin and give him the enjoyment of complete, complete regeneration of heart and soul from the top to the bottom in an instant of time. You will not hear that preached, and nobody cares. You hear everything but that. You know what else gets me? You will never, never, I shouldn't say never, it's not true. You will hardly ever hear ministry, ever speak to encourage people to believe that it's God's will to touch their physical bodies with the anointing to heal. They will not say that. What they will say is, well, if God wills, then so be it. Well, it maybe God's, they give everything else. And, and, and that, that is such an abomination of unbelief. And nobody cares. Nobody challenges it. Nobody talks about it. And people just come and go in droves every Sunday. And nobody, nobody cares the Ark of the Covenant is not in God's house anymore. Amen. Yes. Whew. I applauded this guy that did stand up against this. The problem is yesterday he apologized that he stood up. And I thought, well, I guess Jesse got him too. Because he was saying it was a Jesse spirit. Why did he apologize? Think about it. Why did he apologize? Was it money? Was it, was it because he wasn't going to get paid? Who knows? Why did he apologize? It, why, if he apologized, so he wasn't right? He said God woke him up at 2 in the morning. So was it God or who it was? You know what? He apologized, meaning, I don't care. 
I don't care God's not. I don't care that there's strippers going up and down poles. I don't care there's abominations taking place under the banner of Jesus Christ. That's what the man is saying. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't care. Boy, this is amazing to me. See, I used to think that was, a, a, that was lunacy, and it is. Israel lost the Ark of the Covenant. It's just as much lunacy. The church today lost the power of God, and they don't care. <laughs> That's why I give you that verse to prove what I'm saying. I know it, it, it looks crazy, and it is. You know, no one, it seems like no preaching of true repentance as the way to salvation, and no one cares. This is, this is what, what, what brings worth to your life? You know what it is? The presence of God. I have no other value than the presence of God. Do you know, do you know what makes this church, you, you know what gives it its, its value? It's not the seats. It's not the, you know what gives this church its value? The presence of God. You take the presence out of this house and we are nothing. You take the presence out of this house, we are just as any other man. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What gives us value is the presence of God. What gave Israel its value was, was not themselves. It was the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. Amen. Yes. See, I don't, hear me, I don't need an ex-stripper climbing a pole. I don't need to borrow the Philistine's way of worship. All I need is his presence. That'll be enough. Yes. You know what I found? I have found all of that stuff is substitutes for the missing Ark of the Covenant. Yes. We don't have the power, so we have to substitute something. But I want to tell you something. This is what happened. These denominations, these denominations, what they have done is this. They have decided that the word isn't enough. Jesus isn't enough. The Holy Spirit isn't enough. The power of God isn't enough. We need something else. But I'm here to tell you the word of God is enough. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is enough. If we never have, and play along with me, if we never have rock and music in this house, you have Jesus, he's enough. If we never have, and, and play along, I'm not insinuating, <laughs> but if we never have stage, Hollywood, uh, uh, whatever, up here performing just to get people, if we never have that, be, but do rest assured of this, if you have the presence of God in here, that'll be enough. When you have the presence of God, those kinds of things are very cheap. Believe me, Hollywood is cheap. They've sold their soul, and they wear their shame as a badge of honor. Has no place in the house of God. We need the power of God back in the house. Yes. But do notice, he doesn't just drop in. You got to get it. You got to seek him. Yes. David had to seek. God didn't say, David, I'll tell you where it's at, and I'll just bring it back myself. He didn't do that at all. You seek, and God said, then you'll find. Amen. See, the evidence of hunger is seeking. Yes. We used to even say that in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People would seek for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You see, then the crowd came along and said, well, you don't have to do any of that and this and the other. Yes, it is an act of faith. I agree with that. But whatever happened to people hungering for something? Yes. <laughs> Are you hearing me this, morning, or this evening? Now, when David, when David finally got word, we found the ark. We're ashamed where we found it. 
We're ashamed that the condition that was allowed to be under in all these elements. But they began to do things, and I'm not even going to get into the story of, you, you know, what happened to the young man along the road and all of this and that. But what I want you to see is, just as the testimony on Sunday morning, the reaction to Jesus was a man who never knew Jesus, and his reaction was, I need forgiveness. Here is a man, David, King David, and when the presence of God, when he comes in close proximity to the Ark of the Covenant, and we're going to take it home. It's coming back. He's so overjoyed, brother. Jay. He's so exhilarated that he begins out of him erupts a psalm, a song unto the Lord. His life reacts to the presence of God. And here he begins to speak in 116, uh, 116.1. He says, and you can read with me, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Sister Mary, isn't this beautiful? He says, the sorrows of death come past. They've surrounded me. The pains of hell have cut upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I, I was brought low, and he helped me. <laughs> Oh, return unto thy rest, my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my, my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, listen to these words even, I believed, therefore... I have I spoken. <laughs> you know, we ought to, we ought to say what we believe. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I believe, therefore, have I spoken. You'll read that Paul writes this again and reiterates it in the New Testament. I was greatly afflicted. How many of you ever acted rashly? Amen. Only three of us, I'm sure, in here. But uh, he said, I, I, I like the next part. He's human. He said, I said in my haste, all men are liars. And then he said, but what shall I render? Now, this is the thing that gets me right here. What shall I render unto the Lord? In other words, this one that's done all of this for me, what, what, what should I, what can I give him? What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me. Or we would say, what, what, what can I give to the Lord that's done so much for me? Have you ever felt that? What, 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 can, I, what can I give? Lord, what can I give to you that you've, you've given so much to me? He said, I will take, I'm going to come back to that. But I will take the cup of salvation upon the name of the Lord. I, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all of his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, truly, I am thy servant. I am thy servant, the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord. Now in the presence of all these, in the courts of the Lord, Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. Whew. That was his initial response to the presence of God. Mm. I pondered on that. And in pondering on it, I got some things written down. 
because what can I give to the Lord? I mean, he's done, what can I give? But you know, when you think about it, what does God want out of me? Well, in these verses, he wants praise, worship. He wants our devotion. He, he wants us, he wants us to shut everything else off and just put our mind on him. If we ask God, what can I give you? I, you've done all of this. What, what can I, well, well I, I, I want your devotion. Oh, is it something I can give? Yes, I can. I can give him devotion. I can give him the sacrifice of praise. You, you see, <laughs> in, in uh, an, another is, Lord, I can give unto him my love, my love to him. I can, I can present my love, my, not just a, a, an outward adoration, but my heart's deepest sensation of love and compassion that desires only him. This is what I can give to him. Do you know that I can give him of my body in obedience? I can give him my mind. I can give him all of my members of my body for him to use for his glory. I can give him my mouth so that he can use it to tell others about him. You know, when we, when we look at what can I do, what can I do for God is do for others what he's done for us. God has saved my soul. I can't save another man, but I can give another man the opportunity. I, I, can, I can tell somebody what God has done for me. Amen? Amen? Can, can, can we do, what, what happens, what happens if we're in a room and there's a lot of small talk and the next thing you know, we start telling our testimony. What happens, what happens in a room? I'll just use myself, but you all have your own testimonies and many of them throughout the years in your own life. But what happens? I'll just use my own experiences. You fill in the blanks with your own. But if I'm in a room and this happened not just recently and I, I was, we talked and it had nothing to do with what was going on, but somebody had made mention known that I was sick at one time. And I immediately launched, I knew there was my opportunity. And I said, well, that incurable, well, that disease that you had, uh, uh, how are you, did you, are you cope? Uh, no, no, I was healed. Oh, no, well, nobody, that's incurable. Oh, it, it is incurable to man. I said, but take a look at me. I'm living proof that God heals. When you start talking about Jesus and his works, do you know what you've done? You have just opened up <laughs> the temple and the spirit of God is now present in the location. Why? People start behaving differently. They, they, they get quiet about everything else they're talking and now they're listening about the works of the Lord. <laughs> What happens when you introduce? It may seem awkward. It may feel awkward to those who don't know him. That's normal. But what happens 
when somebody is talking about something that the world cannot change, a child or a son or a daughter or anybody else in addiction and this and that. And the moment you speak, well, I was that way. I know somebody that, that was that way. Someone is in our church who was once like that. And today they are completely different. What is the difference? Well, Jesus Christ broke the chains of addiction in their lives. And as a result, they are living totally different. And now it may feel awkward to the ones you're talking to, but you can see it in the atmosphere. You can feel it. All of a sudden, what have you done? You have loosed the presence of God. He has come out. He has come out of that temple and he is touching lives around you. And you get to spectate and watch the activity of the Holy Spirit right before your eyes. There are things seen and unseen. The moment you speak it into the atmosphere, you can see their eyes change. You can see their expressions change. You, you see outward physical manifestation, but what you don't see and as an act of faith, I will guarantee you the Holy Spirit does not remain on the outside of any man. He will find his way through that skin, through the bone, into the inner spirit and soul of that individual. And while they are listening to you, he's working on the inside of their polluted vessel. <laughs> I'm telling you, even though they are hearing out here, but God is touching their mind with the power of God's word. You see, he is in the business of awakening people to how, yes, to how miserable they really are, how lost they really are, but he doesn't leave us in that condition. But while you're talking, he's actively engaged within their inner heart. He's touching the pulse of their conscience. He's, he's convicting it. He's pricking it. He's trying to move them into an action to respond, and it leaves them to a place, whoa, I am lost. And at that moment, where do I go? Where, where do I go? And it's, don't come to me. I'm, I'm not the Savior. But what I am is, what I do is I point to Jesus. Amen. Where do I go? What do I do? And let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> You say, well, they'll spit and holler. No, 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 wait a minute. When they get to that condition and they realize, yes, see, there's something innate in man. <clears throat> Though sin has polluted man's judgment. Though sin has darkened man's vision. Though sin has made man deaf. Though sin has hardened the heart of man. But there's something sin could not get rid of. And there's something innate in an individual, every person innate inside of them. There is a little bit of, uh, of, of, of a response always they carry with them, searching for the one who created them. And when you hit the pulse of that and you lance that open and that comes out of their heart and saying, ha, 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 Jesus Christ, you see, you, you, at that moment they awake and say, that is, ah, my heart, ah, there's my creator. Ah, I've been lost. I've been undone. I've been miserable. And there, 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 there it is. There he is. You know all you've done. You want to know how powerful the presence is? That's the power of God's presence. It melts the hard heart. It touches the indolent mind. It opens the deaf ear. It begins to remove the veil and the cater spiritual cataracts of the eyes. And it begins to remove the calluses of the spiritual sensitivity. They start to feel something. They start to see something. They start to hear something. They start to sense something on the inside. What is our job? Don't lose the presence of God. I can walk into a building and I can blare music and I can put on a show and I can dance and I can do all of those things and people leave feeling nothing more than an emotional ripple from a beat. 
That is not what touches people. That's not the presence of God. The crescendo or the, the, the altitude and volume and decibel level of music or anything is not the presence of God. Amen. You cannot substitute the presence of God. The presence of God only, only, only resides and moves where first he is welcomed and it's in the maintenance program and it's maintained through obedience. And when those two things are in tandem and in synonymous movement, the presence of God is there. Notice what Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, where not just any old place under any old banner. He said, they that are gathered together in my name. It's not just coming in saying, well, we all say Jesus. No, it, we are in under the umbrella of his authority, which requires submission. He said, if two or three are gathered together in submission to my authority, I am there. My presence is 100% guaranteed. Yes. Now, I wonder... I don't care how many people. I'm not a numbers guy when it comes to Christianity. What I am after is quality. <laughs> Amen. But you know, if all of us in here, no matter the number, what happens? What happens? What happens when we are in one mind? in one accord, in submission to him, then the presence is here. And that means even on Sunday mornings, sinners come, they will feel the power of God. I'm encouraged. I am encouraged. I'm seeing people come. We're starting to see now getting another, you know, folks are starting to come on Sunday morning, new people. And I'm hearing the thread. Now we have to protect it. Please protect it. Your life depends on it. It's not something to be fooled with. But when you have new people coming in and they'll say, how are you today? This after a service, how, 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 it's good to have you. How are you doing today? You okay? Is everything all right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we really felt something. You know what it is? It's the presence of the Lord. When they say, you know, we're coming back. Well, why are they coming back? It's not because we're all handsome and gorgeous. <laughs> Amen. Do you know what is the attraction? The presence of God. It's magnetic. The presence of God is a, is, is a charisma. It, it, is, it is very charismatic. It, it is attractive to the human soul. This is why people, when they come into the service or get around you for any length of time, when they're troubled, they feel peace. Yes. Now, it's temporary until they get a hold of him. But it is a, it is a foretaste of what they can have. I can't tell you how much, I, 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 and I'm, I'm amazed at this. I really am, saints of God. I'm amazed at this God we serve. How, how I, you can't take any, I don't want to. You can't, it's, it's unjust. I, I, I'm just, I'm amazed at what God does to people through you. We don't deserve any, nothing. But when I, I see God's effect on people, when you get around heathens, when you get around rebels, <laughs> when you get around people who are very foul 
and you sit with them. I don't run from people like that. What do you do? I run to them. I'll spend time with them. Now, hypocrites, mm. Mm. But, but people like that, I will not run from them. Why? They need me. They need you. Oh, they're horrible. Oh, get to them. Greater is he that's in you that's in them. You will overwind that. And listen, you don't know what they're going through. They're living in a prison. And when they can sit with you and say words like this, uh, you know, man, I don't know what it is, but when I'm around you, it doesn't, it's not me. It's, it's this Christ we have. Who is his presence? I'm here. Yeah, it seems like all the de- demons go quiet. How are you doing? Oh, I, f- I feel good. You feel good. Yeah, I haven't felt good in, in months. Well, years. But I don't know what it is, boy. Just It's a vibe you're giving. No, it's not a vibe. It's the presence. <laughs> I'm tore up from the floor. But boy, just sitting. I, I don't know what it is. But, <sighs> do you think over the meal, do you think maybe could you pray over the meal? Now, they're not worried that the meal will kill them. But they have an idea that when you pray, something happens and feels good. (laughs) What do you do? Do what Pastor Matt does as well. Pray salvation. God, I thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ who has saved our souls. And God doesn't mind. Peek out of one eye and see what they're doing. Now, some heathens will just mumble. I've seen them, heard them mumble. Oh, boy. <laughs> but, 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 but be, let the pre- as much as you can get out. What are you doing? You're praying over the meal. You're giving thanks, yes. But what are you doing at the same time? That, that prayer that you think might be insignificant, first of all, it sanctifies your meal. But you know what else it does? It emits the presence of God. You have introduced him to the dinner table. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Don't don't you just want to shout, thank you, Lord. (laughs) Give thanks. That psalm tells us, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Seek him. Oh, that's what it's about. Seek him. Let's keep his presence in this house. And I'm done, but I'm just keep his presence in this house. I will even tell you, and I'm done, but I will tell you how powerful God is. People can watch this, and in their room, the Word knows no boundary of distance, and they can feel it in their room. They can feel it in their kitchen. They can feel it on their job. We just learned recently there's a place of employment that hears it every day. Can you imagine that? If I walk in here myself preaching, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jim. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Aren't we, isn't it wonderful we got together tonight? This beats Walmart, doesn't it? <laughs> Katie. <laughs> Let's stand tonight. I I tell you, I really, I want that presence always to be here. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't we just kind of bunch up there a little bit and and get near each other if we can. And we're just going to pray together. Just kind of get closer together. Some, all of you kind of, you know, Katie, come on across there and Yeah, 
yeah, over here, over here, yeah. Let's, let's just come together. Come together with each other. I'll go to this other mic a while. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Whatever's comfortable to you. Thank you. Yeah. 